Field, Odell Beckham Jr. currently is finalizing a deal to go play with the Los Angeles Rams. They're in the final stages of getting that deal done, but the full expectation is that he's going to be a Los Angeles Ram. And just like that, that's all she wrote. Odell Beckham Jr.'s time in Cleveland is over, and he's taking his talents to Venice Beach to join a high-powered Rams offense that was already one of the best in the league. With the way that Odell's 2020 season went, combined with how badly things have gone for him so far in 2021, he has more doubters than ever before, and the fantasy community has been pretty down on him lately. However, the change of scenery, combined with a brutal injury to Rams wide receiver Robert Woods, has set the stage for Odell to return to his elite status over the back half of the 2021 season. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. So it's actually been about three weeks since I posted my last analysis video. And if you guys have been following the channel this season, you know that I've been posting almost every Saturday morning, one of my analysis breakdowns. And the reason for the absence is that I actually had some family fly out and come stay in town for about a week for my birthday. And I hadn't seen them in a while, like over a year. So I really wanted to make sure that I took some time to hang out, but we're back now, back on the grind, and really just in time for one of the biggest stories of the fantasy football season so far, Odell Beckham to the Rams. Now, what does this mean for Odell? What does this mean for the other Rams options? And what does this mean for another guy who I haven't really seen anybody talking about, and it's kind of surprising. I'm going to give my thoughts on all of that, and we are going to take a look at what Odell has put on tape so far this season, but before we do that, I just want to give you guys a quick rundown on how exactly we got here. Odell had a pretty great first season with the Browns back in 2019. The reunion with Jarvis Landry, who was Odell's college teammate back at LSU, went over with flying colors as both guys were able to have really solid seasons and they had a ton of fun while doing it. Baker Mayfield, in just his second season in the league, was able to facilitate Jarvis Landry's career high in receiving yards, and Odell was eating too. Both guys actually put up very similar numbers in 2019, although Landry had slightly higher totals in every category. They had almost exactly the same totals in terms of targets, catches, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns. Although, like I said, Landry edged out Odell in every category. The story was the same for their advanced metrics as both guys posted extremely similar yards per target, yards per reception, yards per game, receptions per game, catch rate, all of that. But again, Landry edged out Odell very slightly in every category. So while Odell hadn't exactly asserted himself as the top dog in this passing attack, there was a lot of optimism going into 2020 to see what he could do in his second season with the team. However, 2020 was a completely different story for Odell. It was a season that was marred by injury, from the lead up to the season, during the season, and ultimately it was the reason for the premature end to his season. Odell came into training camp still recovering from an off-season surgery he had on a core muscle. He recovered from that in time for the start of the season, but he quickly picked up injuries to his back and to his toe, and he also played through a non-COVID illness at one point. He was able to fight through all of those issues, but his season came to an end in just week seven, when he tore his ACL on just the second offensive snap of the game. Now, while it's hard to take just the six full games that he did play and extrapolate them across the whole season to predict how things would have gone, I have to say that the trends that we were seeing were not looking good for Odell. He was on pace to see a pretty significant drop in every receiving category across the board except for touchdowns. While we'll never know exactly what would have happened, 2020 was shaping up to be a pretty major letdown for Odell, especially considering that a lot of fantasy managers had paid up to get him expecting a big step up considering how well he had played in his first season with the team. Now, a big part of this can be attributed to Kevin Stefanski's takeover of the offense. Stefanski was hired as the head coach before the 2020 season after serving as the Vikings offensive coordinator the year prior. He called the offensive plays throughout 2020, and the offense placed a huge emphasis on the running back tandem of Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Baker Mayfield set career lows in pass attempts, pass completions, and passing yards, and basically all of the Browns receiving options suffered for it. Even Jarvis Landry, who played in 15 full games, set career lows in targets, uh, receptions, and receiving touchdowns. 
However, nobody was complaining about this new offense because it was helping Cleveland win a ton of games. Their 11-5 record was the best in almost 30 years, and they were finally able to snap their postseason win drought, getting a playoff win for the first time since 1994. Now, winning can really smooth over a lot of issues, while losing tends to bring those issues to the surface and amplify them, which brings us to 2021. The 2021 Browns were simply not a good match for Odell. In September and October, the team just didn't really look like it had taken that next step towards becoming a true contender in the AFC, and Odell's role on the offense was shrinking even more than it had in 2020, despite the fact that he was working his ass off to contribute. Remember, this is a guy who had just torn his ACL 11 months before his return to the field, and that was no small task to recover that quickly and be playing at full speed so soon. On top of that, he also picked up a shoulder injury this season that he's been playing through, which is actually a pretty severe one that's going to require surgery at some point. He suffered a grade 3 sprain to the AC joint in his shoulder, and that's actually the most severe variation of that sprain that an athlete can get and still play through. Now, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but from what I've researched, the grade 3 sprain uh, happens when the shoulder becomes completely detached and it involves some torn ligaments or at least damaged ligaments. And my understanding is that grade four and above entails all that stuff plus movement and damage to the collarbone and potentially permanent damage to the area if you don't get it treated right away. So Odell was playing through that grade three sprain as just an added layer of adversity to the ACL recovery, and he just wasn't really reaping any benefits from it. Odell played six full games with the Browns this season, and he was averaging career lows across the board, whether it be targets, yards, catches, touchdowns, yards per game, targets per game, receptions per game, uh, catch rate, whatever category or metric you can think of, Odell was setting a career low in it. And to make matters worse, the team wasn't even winning, and the offense as a whole was starting to really struggle. In the three games leading up to Odell's departure from the team, the Browns had averaged less than 14 points per game, and they had lost two of those three games. Now, the final straw came in week eight, where Odell played on 73% of the snaps, which was his highest snap rate in a month, and yet he saw just one single target, which came in a losing effort. Over the next few days, we started hearing rumblings about Odell being excused from practice, and things just escalated so quickly to the point that by the end of the week, his time in Cleveland was over, just pending some paperwork. So that's how we got here, and I thought it was really important for me to go into all of that so that you guys could get a full understanding of the context here. Odell was not cut by the Browns because he's washed. He didn't go full Antonio Brown and have a mental breakdown, at least not this time. And I think what really happened is that he just got fed up with trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The Browns offense this season has shifted even further away from the passing attack with Baker Mayfield on pace to throw the fewest passing attempts of his career again. So I find myself actually agreeing with the diva wide receiver who's forcing his way out of a bad situation into a better one. When you watch what Odell has put on tape in 2021, it becomes clear that he still has a ton of gas left in the tank, and he wants to either win as a team or be great as an individual. The real problem is that neither of those things were happening this season. He's been basically just flat out underused, and when he has been used, the quality of opportunities just hasn't been very good. So with all of that being said, now let's jump into the game film. The first thing that I learned from watching Odell's 2021 game film is that he's clearly not washed, and I don't think he's lost a step. For a guy who blew out his knee less than a calendar year ago, the fact that he can already get so wide open on his routes is really impressive. And you have to keep in mind that his route running is only going to get stronger as the season progresses as he can get more and more confident in trusting that knee and making more explosive moves off of it. Even as it stands right now, Odell is still a really scary matchup for any defender to take one-on-one, -on -one, and they might just get embarrassed if Odell is in his bag on that play. It doesn't always have to be a perfectly executed route or the perfectly set up concept, as you can see on this play. He has the presence of mind to keep his route alive as Baker extends the play, and he still has the explosiveness to suddenly break up field to get open for the big play. Of course, he still has amazing ball skills, and that's just not something that an injury is going to take from him. He's still capable of hauling in those highlight reel catches, he just hasn't really been given the best opportunities to do it this season. Which brings me to Baker Mayfield. 
Now, Baker hasn't been great this season, but he hasn't actually been terrible either. The main problem is that his passing volume has dropped to the point that, like I said, he's on pace for the fewest passing attempts of his career, but his efficiency has not climbed up enough to offset that. While he has done well on the short and intermediate routes to Odell, the deep shots to Odell have just been really, really bad. Now, I'm not going to go over every single misconnection or bad throw from Baker this season like that one guy did in the video, the now infamous video that Odell's father had shared, which, by the way, I highly recommend you guys go check that one out. I'll actually link it in the description of this video. But I did want to highlight really the most egregious examples of when Baker targeted Odell and it just went terrible because on a lot of these plays, Odell is running excellent routes and he's getting wide open and the throws are just, I mean, they're not, they're not just bad, they're actually baffling. Like, I just don't understand how a professional quarterback misses a guy this badly with a clean pocket and that much open space to work with. Now, not every single one of these plays has been an easy throw for Baker to make. For example, in this play, he has guys all around him in the pocket, but if he can just get this ball elevated, it's a free touchdown for Odell. Also on this play, a similar situation, it's not an easy throw for Baker to make, but I mean, look at that. He just swim moves right past the defender, wide open, so much space to make a throw, and Baker puts it in the one spot where he can't come down with it. And then we have examples like this. This is just unacceptable from Baker. Like, it's a busted coverage, he's wide open, he can, he can shimmy his way into the end zone, and I mean, I have no words for this throw. Here we have Odell running a really simple post route, and it should be so easy for Baker to read where he needs to put this ball. Just let him settle down in the zone between the safeties. But instead, he leads him way too far upfield right into their coverage, and it's uncatchable. Now here we have an example. It's not actually Baker. This is Case Keenum. I mean, Odell just cannot catch a break with whatever quarterback there is. Watch him just cook this defender. Out and up move. He torches him. This ball just has to go into the back of the end zone. Instead, it's way too short. The defender actually gets both hands on him. With how negative the vibes have been around Odell's fantasy outlook this season, it's so crazy to think that just a few of these throws connecting would have launched Odell's season-long ranking from the depths of the wide receiver 88 or whatever he is right now, all the way up into the wide receiver three range. And I'm not just spitballing, I checked out the math. If he had just hauled in a few of these terrible passes, he would be in the wide receiver three range. And if he had been putting up those kind of numbers this soon after a major knee injury, on this offense with some of the lowest passing volume in the entire league, the optimism would be sky high for Odell, especially if he was still on the move to one of the highest volume passing offenses in the league. So what is Odell's role going to be on the Rams? Well, if you look at what worked well for Odell with the Browns this season, there's a lot of common ground with what the Rams already like to do with their receivers. Besides all the success he had on the basic slants and dig routes, the Browns got Odell involved with manufactured touches, much in the same way that the Rams have utilized Robert Woods for the past few seasons. Whether it be on reverses or end arounds or jet sweeps, the Browns made it a point to get Odell his touches on the ground, and they also emphasized the wide receiver screen game. All of that is really familiar territory for Sean McVay and the Rams, who love to utilize screens and carries to get the receivers involved in creative ways. So I have no doubt that McVay is going to try to play with his shiny new toy right away by forcing the ball to him with short range opportunities. And now that Woods is done for the season, they're actually going to kind of need to use Odell in that role early and often. Also, when the deep shots inevitably do come Odell's way, he's going to have a much higher quality of targets coming from Stafford as opposed to Baker Mayfield. But where exactly does Odell fit in this offense in terms of alignment? Where is he going to line up on the field and whose role is he going to be cutting into? A lot of people might be thinking that it's as simple as, well, he's just going to step right into the exact same role that Robert Woods had, but I'm not quite so sure about that. Based on almost eight seasons worth of data, we know that Odell is definitively an outside receiver. During his time with the Giants, he had an overall wide rate of about 77%, with the lowest season long rate being 70 and during his time with the Browns, which made up about two full seasons worth of games, he had an overall wide rate of 79%, with the lowest season long rate being 77%. Basically, the guy is just not often used as a slot receiver. So Cooper Cup should continue to see the ridiculous amount of usage that he's been getting in 2021. 
As for playing that Robert Woods role, Woods has actually been almost splitting his time between the slot and the outside. He had a 45% slot rate and a 54% outside rate this season, and that's not at all an outlier for Woods. Since he joined the Rams back in 2017, Woods has posted a total slot rate of about 44% compared to his wide rate of 55%. Last season, Woods finished actually almost perfectly 50-50 in terms of slot versus wide. And that was a season in which Cooper Cup played every game, and Cup had a similar slot rate to what he has traditionally posted with the Rams. So up until the injury, Woods was on pace to repeat his usage from last season, and Odell was actually going to be coming in and taking in the role of Van Jefferson. Jefferson is a second-year receiver who has been playing a ton on the outside with a overall wide rate of about 74% during his time with the Rams. His playing time has taken a huge jump up this season as he's seen a 78% snap rate, which is way up from the 22% snap rate that he logged in his rookie year. Now for anybody who hasn't been paying a ton of attention to the Rams offense and might not understand how Deshaun Jackson figured into this, he was pretty much irrelevant, so you don't have to worry about Odell getting the Deshaun Jackson treatment. Um, Deshaun was logging just a 22% snap rate, and in terms of him versus Van Jefferson, Jefferson was by far the wide receiver three. Um, Deshaun was being outpaced in every single category every single week, especially in, in stats like snaps and routes run. So Jefferson was playing the definitive wide receiver three role on this team, and he was doing it by playing mainly on the outside. But that was still valuable for fantasy, and the reason for that is the Rams have actually been running the highest rate of three wide receiver sets of any team in the league this year. In fact, the rate that the Rams are using three wide receiver personnel is higher than any team has used dating back to at least 2016. And as far as I can tell, it might be the highest rate in NFL history. And given that this has been working so well for the Rams, when you consider that they are second in total points scored, second in total offensive yards and first in total passing yards there's just no reason that they're going to switch things up going forward so regardless of who takes over for robert woods slot snaps i think that all three of the top wide receivers are going to have plenty of value now as far as tyler higby goes uh, i know a lot of people were very worried that odell coming to town was going to be pretty much a death sentence for his fantasy value especially considering what we heard about Sean McVay explaining how he would integrate Odell into the offense. A lot of people were speculating, thinking maybe that means a lot more for wide receiver sets, a lot more sets where Higby's not on the field. But with Robert Woods out of the picture now, I actually think this could end up being a positive for Higby. Higby has been a staple on this offense this season. He's been playing a ton of snaps. In fact, only three tight ends have played on more passing plays than Higby. Also, he's fifth in total routes run among tight ends and fourth in terms of routes run while lined up wide for tight ends, which is just super, super valuable usage. But yet he's still just the tight end 13 on the season. Now, that kind of usage has actually been a pretty substantial outlier for Higby in terms of his whole career as he's on pace to shatter his career highs in terms of pass plays, uh, total routes run, slot routes and wide out routes. Also, his usage metrics have been positive outliers as well, as he's setting career highs in terms of route rate, slot rate, and wide rate, even while he's setting career lows in terms of inline rate and pass blocking rate. Just for some context, he's already set career highs in terms of total slot routes run and total wide routes run, and we're only halfway through the season. Now, all of that career high usage is super encouraging, but he just hasn't been able to realize it into actual production since he's not even on pace to set career highs in terms of targets, yards, catches, or even touchdowns. And that's even when you factor in the added 17th game this season. Now, I say all of that just to get the point across that while, yes, he has been a staple in this offense this season, he hasn't been so good with his opportunities that he's going to demand usage at the expense of a guy like Odell and Higby's fantasy value is not going to be able to withstand any kind of cut to his playing time. Luckily for him, with Robert Woods out of the picture now, he probably won't ever see that cut to his playing time. He'll get close to every single snap for the tight end position for the Rams this season and Sean McVay definitely loves his versatility out of the position. So the fact that Robert Woods is no longer playing and there's no longer a reason for the Rams to be running four wide receiver sets 
it just it bodes well for Higby being able to at least maintain his current fantasy value. And if we start seeing things like Odell being double teamed in addition to Cup being double teamed, you could argue that this might actually be a good thing for Higby. Now, the last guy I want to talk about before I wrap things up here is a guy who I feel like has been really, really under discussed in this whole situation, and that's Jarvis Landry. Now, in one sense, I completely understand why he's going under the radar right now, because he really suffered a lot from Stefanski taking over the offense last season, and this season, he missed about a month of time with a knee injury. In 2020, he played a very different role than what he's been used to, and he logged the lowest slot rate of his entire career. Also, he put up the fewest targets and the fewest routes run since his rookie season. And just for some extra context, he barely beat those rookie season numbers in 2020, despite the fact that he actually played on a higher snap rate in 2020 than he did as a rookie. And despite that, he actually still finished as a wide receiver three in fantasy, finishing as the wide receiver 33 and putting up double digit fantasy points in nine games. More importantly, he finished the season really, really strong as the Browns finally stopped trying to use Landry as a fill-in for Odell. See, after Odell went down in week seven, Landry saw his wide rate shoot up to about 48%. Now that's super, super high for Landry that he's never come close to matching that in any season of his career. And for the next four games, that's the rate that he played at on the outside. After that stretch, he returned to mainly playing out of the slot and he thrived again. Over the rest of the season, including the two postseason games, his wide rate plummeted way back down towards like the 30% mark, and the results speak for themselves. Over those seven games, he averaged eight and a half targets, six and a half catches, and about 69 total yards per week. And he racked up a total of six touchdowns over that time too, which averaged out to about 18 and a half PPR fantasy points per game. So he finished 2020 pretty much on fire, but coming into 2021, we didn't really get a good idea of how the Browns really wanted to use him because although he played all of week one, he got injured on the first snap of week two and missed a month. He was sort of eased back into the lineup in week seven. And in the two games after that, he's actually logged a wide rate of just 27%. Now, if that's any indication on how the Browns plan on using him going forward, there's a real chance that he picks up right where he left off in 2020. And you'd be looking at a guy putting up solid wide receiver two, even wide receiver one numbers. And that's a guy that's probably sitting on your waivers right now. Now, I'm not saying that the second half breakout is guaranteed for Landry, but he's a guy that I would absolutely be stashing if he's available in your league. But all in all, the reason for the season, Odell Beckham, I think in terms of real life NFL moves, the Rams made an awesome one in bringing Odell into the fold. He's going to be paired up with arguably the best quarterback he's ever played with in his career on arguably the best team of his career and opposing defenses really just won't be allowed to focus in on him like they have in years past. In terms of fantasy football, it's a little bit harder to say exactly what we can expect or when we can expect it, but I think it goes without saying that I would love to have Odell on my fantasy squad right now. He has some massive upside in this offense, especially as we get deeper and deeper into the season and that chemistry between him and Stafford grows stronger and stronger, as well as he becomes further and further removed from that major knee injury. There aren't too many wide receivers who have the potential to jump from the depths of the waiver wire all the way into elite territory, but I honestly think that Odell has just made that leap. Oof. All right, guys. That is it for this one. I know it was a doozy. It was a long one. Um, I'm hyped to be back making these videos, though. I'm hyped to be back on my schedule, on my grind. I did not miss any weeks in terms of my waiver wire pickup article and video posts. So if you have been missing those, make sure to check them out. Um, every Tuesday morning on Reddit, I post a collection of all of the top waiver pickups for that week. And I include links to my every play videos on this channel. Uh, they're also compiled in a playlist on this channel and uh yeah make sure you guys don't miss those articles every week i'll be back every week every saturday morning with my analysis videos throughout the end of the season and i hope you guys enjoyed this one and i will see you guys in the next one